things to Dalton in case you're at phone. Uh, and like I said, maybe that's your experience. A few years back, there was a little boy named Kevin. And Kevin was just an incredible kid. Very sweet, very kind. He, he never said a bad thing about anyone. He was one of those kids who uh, basically would always do what he was supposed to do, um, was always willing to help anybody. But as nice as Kevin was, his classmates were not the same. So every single day, Kevin's classmates would pick on him and make fun of him and bully him. Uh, you see, Kevin was a little bit smaller than most of his peers. He wasn't overly good at anything. He didn't really talk that much. He had a different approach than most things. And so again, every day of middle school and high school, sweet little Kevin had to deal with all kinds of unsweet classmates. So every day he was in class, as he walked the halls, as he went to his locker, as he sat alone at lunch, Kevin would hear the words, here's the freak. What a loser Kevin is. And even if Kevin wasn't hearing it, he knew what they were whispering. They were whispering, they were talking about how weird he was. And there came a day when Kevin had finally had enough. He got to his breaking point. So he came home and told his parents through tears, like, Mom, Dad, I, I just can't take this anymore. I hate how the other kids treat me. I hate how they talk about me, how they make fun of me. I just want it to stop. I just want to fit in. I just don't want to be weird. And so this morning, we hear this story, and, and we feel bad for Kevin, don't we? By the way, I know some of you are like, Jesse, I need to talk to you after service. I need some names. Like, like, I'm not afraid to Judy chop a kid in the name of Jesus, right? Well, we don't make a practice of spanking other kids, but sometimes it feels like that's what needs to happen. But this morning, as we continue in our study going through the book of 1 Peter, we're actually going to see some good news for the Kevins of the world. As Peter is going to tell these exiled, suffering Christians, it's okay if you don't fit in. Actually, he wants to remind us, that if we follow Jesus, that's not really going to be an option. No, because you see, if you live for him, the world is going to think about us the same way that those teenagers thought about Kevin. They're going to think you're a little bit strange. They're going to believe that you are a little bit weird. And so that's what I want us to see this morning from our text. So if you haven't turned there yet, 1 Peter verses 13 through 21 we're going to see that it's actually okay to be weird. And look, before we get into this, just let me make it clear. Peter is not talking about being weird just for the sake of being weird. But like, I, I think we know weird can be subjective today, can it? So, so for some people, that they want to be considered weird just because they want the attention. So what they'll do, they'll dress in outlandish ways. They do these really strange things that make it to where you can't help but look at them and go, Huh, that's interesting. And, and look, if you don't believe that, normally I would tell you to go to Walmart, but apparently Walmart has bed bugs, so let's, let's hold off on that for a while. <laughs> Maybe try Waffle House or Big Lots, somewhere like that. Look, Peter, listen, it's not talking about being weird for the sake of weirdness. No, he's actually talking about being weird for the sake of holiness. And so we'll get into what holiness actually means. But if we, we think for a moment about what we've already seen, if you've been with us the past two weeks. So the first thing Peter did, he grounded these exiled, excluded Christians in the glorious salvation that had been planned, accomplished, and applied by our triune God. But then after that, he told them, look, just because God has chosen you doesn't mean there's not going to be trials. But you've got to understand, your trials have a so that in them. Like he wants to remind them, as we need to be reminded, God has a reason to put you through some of the things that you're going through. Then he reminded them last week that we live in the time of fulfillment. That they and us were privileged to live in the time that we do. Like we used to think, like man, we used to wonder what would it have been like to be like a prophet or, or even an angel, but they're actually wowed over us. And what would you get experienced through our salvation in Christ? But now the question these Christians have to be wondering, we just kind of think about how this progresses. 
but now what do we do? Like, like Peter, you've told us who we are. You've even explained to us why this is happening, and that's great. Like, we appreciate that. But now what do we do in the waiting? And so what Peter's going to do, he's going to say, okay, now here's what you do. you got to be weird. Like, you've got to act different because you are different. And so that's our main point this morning, that when you have a hope the world doesn't have, it will lead you to live in a way the world's not really going to understand. It's going to lead us to look weird. So now let's pray, and we'll read our text this morning. Father, we just thank you again for your word. God, we thank you that those who fear it, those who delight in it, are blessed. And this morning, God, we just come to your word, understanding that you have spoken to us. And God, I just ask this morning that it would transform us. We love you, we thank you. In Christ's name, amen. So if you're able, would you stand with me? We'll read verses again, 13 through 21. And God's word tells us, therefore, or in light of everything Peter has just said, here's what you do. With your minds ready for action, be sober-minded, and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. If you appeal to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. For you know that you are redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. You can be seated. Who do you want to be like? And so maybe the older you get, the harder that question becomes to answer. So it could be the older you get, the less you really like anybody. But as a kid, did we all not have someone that we idolized? So growing up, didn't you have someone that you were thinking, I just wish I could grow up to be like them? So maybe you grew up in the 60s or the 70s, and you always dreamed of being like Clint Eastwood. Or maybe you dreamed of being like John Wayne. Or maybe you grew up in the 60s and 70s and wanted to be like Elvis. Or, or maybe for the female side, it was Barbra Streisand. Or Aretha Franklin. Maybe even Dolly Parton. Or if you grew up in the 80s, maybe you envisioned shooting a ball like Larry Bird, right? Throwing a ball like Nolan Ryan. Maybe you envision singing like Madonna or dancing like Michael. And I just keep waiting for the spirit to get a hold of someone and for somebody to do the moonwalk. <laughs> and in my mind, I just feel like it's going to be Matthew Carpenter. I think it's going to happen one of these times. Or maybe you're like me and you grew up in the 90s. And who you wanted to be like was none other than the real hero of the 90s. And it wasn't Michael Jordan. It, it, it wasn't Britney Spears. No, the real hero of the 90s was none other than Walker, Texas Ranger. <laughs> than Chuck Norris himself. I mean, what little boy didn't go out on the playground and try to beat everybody up like Chuck Norris? Did you all know that history tells us the Dead Sea was actually alive until Chuck Norris swam in it? Did you know that one time Chuck Norris kicked a donkey in the chin and that's where giraffes come from? Did y'all know that? But look, he's a true American hero, and growing up, I wanted to be just like him. So this morning, whoever that was for you, whoever you hope to grow up to be like, the big idea of this passage comes in verses 15 and 16, where the call is not to grow up to be like another person, but it's actually to grow to be like God. 
Now, don't misunderstand. We have to be careful here. Peter is not saying that we are to be like God in his knowledge. That's not possible. We are to be like God in his power. Again, not possible. But he says we are to be like God in his what, church? In his holiness. Look at it there. But as the one who called you. So who called you? That was God the Father. You are also to be holy in all your conduct. Again, for it's written. And so this comes from several places in Leviticus. Leviticus 11.44, Leviticus 19.20. Be holy. Because that's what I am. Because I am holy. And so this entire section centers around this idea of holiness. And so it's important that we know what this word means. Because when it comes to the holiness of God, both the Old and New Testaments, they talk more about that attribute than any of the others. So maybe you're familiar with that scene in Isaiah 6 where you've got this prophet Isaiah and he's kind of got this vision of God sitting on the throne. And the angels are around, and they're not singing, or they're not saying, God is love, love, love. They're not saying, God is mighty, mighty, mighty. No, they're saying, this God is holy, holy, holy. And so what does it mean to be holy? Well, first, for just a second, let's talk about what it doesn't mean. Holiness does not mean religious performance. So holiness is not us trying to act like all the other church people well this is how they sing the songs well well, this is how they dress this is how they talk listen those things don't make you holy because you see holiness is not about conformity it's actually the opposite so the hebrew word for holy is actually kodesh and what it means literally is to cut away So holiness means to be cut away, to be separate, to be totally different from those who don't know God. So it's like the saying, you've been cut from a different cloth. That's where holiness comes from. Look, there are really two areas you need to understand when it comes to your personal holiness. So first you have what we call positional holiness, which just means if you are here and you're a Christian, at the moment of salvation, you have been set apart. You have been changed positionally. So what we mean is that once your position was that of heading towards eternal destruction because of your sin against God. But if you have been saved from the penalty of your sin through Christ, where you now stand before God has been positionally changed forever. So we are now forgiven. We are now citizens of the new eternal kingdom. That's exactly what we saw in baptism. They once were in darkness, but God, by his grace, has called them out of darkness into his glorious light. So you've got positional holiness. But then at the same time, you also have practical holiness, which means we as Christians, again, have been set apart. We've been cut away from the world. But at the same time, we must put in the effort to distance ourselves from this world. And so that's what Peter's actually talking about here. So he's saying, all right, guys, I've told you. God has made you positionally holy. He's called you by his grace. He's set you apart. Now live out your calling. Now live like you don't fit in, because guess what? You actually shouldn't fit in. It's like Peter's going, look, your life should look so different from those who don't follow Jesus. You need to be ready for them to treat you like Kevin's classmates treated him. And this morning, is that not an issue for a lot of us? So, So we might be older than Kevin, but at the end of the day, we're not really that much different than Kevin. Like, nobody really desires to be thought of as weird. We don't want to be an outcast. But friends, in many ways, that's what holiness actually looks like. Look, here's the reality of holiness. Sin is rebellion against the God who made the world. But holiness is the opposite. Holiness is rebellion against the ways of the world. So listen, everybody here this morning, you are a rebel one way or another. You either live in sin and you rebel against God or you pursue holiness and in that you're going to end up rebelling against the world. But then how are we supposed to do it? Like, how can we be holy in a world that seems anything but? That's what Peter shows us in these verses. So he gives us five things. 
that help us to be holy like God is holy. So number one, if you're going to be holy, if you're going to be seen as different than the world, you must think differently than the world. And this makes sense that Peter starts here. It makes sense that Peter starts with the mind. Because isn't it true that what you think dictates what you do? Right? So I think it'd be good for me to go to the lake today. I, I think it'd be good for me to go shopping. So what I'll do, I'll call in to work sick, right? Or, or I think it'd be a great day to go golfing. So what I'll do, I'll text my wife and tell her how beautiful she is, right? That's just how our minds operate. But look at how Peter starts this call to be holy. Therefore, with your minds ready for action. In the literal translation in the Greek is to actually gird up the loins of your mind. And now, that sounds weird, doesn't it? Like, like, like if you come up to me and you say, Jess, you need to gird up your loins. That's going to make me uncomfortable. I'm going to ask you politely to never say that to me again. But look, what gird up your loins meant was that you needed to be prepared to act. It was a way of saying that they didn't need to leave those long robes that they would commonly wear down around their ankles where they would trip and fall if they tried to run. No, they needed to gird it. They needed to pull it up to above their knees so they'd be prepared to act if they needed to. But the question is, how do we do that? So how do we get our minds ready for action? Well, Peter says, well, you, you actually just need to be sober-minded. And usually, when we think of the word sober, we, we think of it in the context of alcohol, don't we? And I think e even that, that provides a helpful framework as we think about what Peter's saying. So, so consider how drunkenness affects every aspect of the human body. Or, or, or so they say, the scouts on, I, I've never been drunk. Uh, I have drunk a lot of thirds, though, and I imagine it's similar, similar result. But look, when you're drunk, is it not true? It clouds your judgment, right? When you're drunk, it disorients you. When you're drunk, it provokes you to do things you would normally not do. And so I think what we're seeing here, when you have this kind of context of drunkenness, not being sober-minded, it's showing us, hey, your mind can't think rightly. And Peter's saying here, if your mind can't think rightly, you've got no shot at being holy. Look, here's an important truth for us to understand this morning. The battle for holiness in our lives starts with what we allow ourselves to think on in our heads. That's what Peter or what Paul actually says in Romans 12. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed, be changed, be different by the renewing of your what, church? By the renewing of your mind. Well, look, what the world we live in is doing is trying to get us drunk. It's trying to get our minds so full of nonsense that it clouds our judgment. So it wants to dull our minds to the point that we think contrary to what God has said. And Peter is giving this warning here. Hey, don't be mentally intoxicated with the things of this world. And so what do we do to have a mind that's thinking rightly? So how do we actually have this mind that's ready for action? Well, I think there are a lot of things, but just let me give you one for time's sake. If you want your mind ready for action, you need to start your day with the things of God. Listen, when you wake up, I would challenge you even this week, when you wake up, before you grab your phone, which is what we're tempted to do, isn't it? Before you move on to the next thing, before you start thinking through that list of 1,200 things that you have to get done that day, would you just stop and pray? Would you open up God's word and listen to what he's saying? It's like the psalmist says in Psalm 143.8. Let me hear of your unfailing love each morning, for I'm trusting you. Each morning, say, God, would you show me where to walk? Because today I'm giving myself to you. You see what that'll do? It'll help you to think, to know, oh, there really is a God. He really does care for me. He really is worth living for. So number one, you must think differently. Number two, if you're going to be seen as different in the world, you must hope differently. Because let me ask you this morning, what does the world put its hopes in? 
Now look, we would give all kinds of answers, wouldn't we? We would not say, okay, well, the world hopes in money, right? That's where their hope resides. They got a lot of money. That's good. That, that's where we find our hope. We might say, well, the world hopes in being successful. Well, we hope that we can accomplish this or accomplish that. Well, we hope in good relationships, in, in good marriages, in good jobs. Well, we hope that at some point we're able to retire happily. We might say, well, we hope in certain presidents, in, in certain reforms. Look, we know if our hope is actually set on these things, eventually, usually sooner than later, these things will disappoint us. That's why Peter says, guys, please don't hope in any of these things. But set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Christ. And so here's the reality. Here's what I think is true for most of us. Most of us are really good at this life thing. So most of us in this room, we, we kind of have this life thing figured out. What I mean by that is this. Some of us know how to make ourselves look really good. We do. We know how to appear successful. We know what it takes for people to like us, to look up to us, and even in some cases be jealous of us. So from the outside perspective, many of us, we appear like we're winning at life. And look, I, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. It's obviously not wrong to be successful. No, be successful for the glory of God. But look, to be thought of as winning at life, hear me, it's not always a compliment. Because if you win at life, you might have won, but hear me, you have won at the wrong game, church. You see, again, what does this world hope in? They hope, essentially, ultimately, that they can win at the game of life. The hope is that people will look at us, will look at them, and go, wow, they're so amazing. We want people to look at us and go, wow, you're so good at this thing. You're such a great boss. You're such a great leader. You're such a great nurse or a teacher or a coach or a manager. You're so funny. You're so cute. You're so smart. You're so creative. And if people say that about you, again, you might feel like you're winning. But get this, you're winning at a game that doesn't really matter. Like when the clock runs out. When that game ends and you go to collect your prize, God is going to say, sorry, but I have nothing for you. It's like the early church father, John Chrysostom, famously said, man, this kind of hits you deep. If you knew how quickly people would forget about you after your death, and it's true, you would not seek in your life to please anyone but God. And look, this is why we live differently than the world, because we have a different hope. Because our hope is not in winning the game of life, church, or it shouldn't be. No, our hope is in the fact that Jesus has already won on our behalf. That's what Peter's saying in verse 21, that God raised Jesus from the dead. And now our faith and our hope are not in any of these things, but they're actually in God. And look, what we hope in determines how we live. And how we live actually demonstrates what we hope in. So think different, hope different. Thirdly, if you're going to be seen as different than the world, approach your past differently. Look, I think I know the answer to this question. I'm going to ask it anyway. Have you ever done something extremely dumb? So the answer to that is yes, right? Like, oh, that's an easy question. But have you ever done something extremely dumb, but then in time, you went back and did that dumb thing again? Anybody ever guilty of that? Most of us, right? It's like, for example, have you ever went to, to Salsa's or Monterey and, and you, you've eaten like seven baskets of chips? And it's dumb, right? And, and you say, I'm never going to do that again. But then you go back and the waitress comes and says, do you want more chips? And you go, why would you even ask? <laughs> of course, bring the chips. Or, or maybe you said, I'm not going to order anything I don't need off of Amazon ever again, right? And the next day, you've got like a, a Dr. Phil throw pillow arriving at your door. You've got a toothbrush for your toothbrush in the mail. But look, to do something dumb once, that's one thing. But to keep going back over and over again, this is another thing. That's what Peter's addressing. As obedient children, verse 14, 
do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. So Peter is going here, listen, if you have actually tasted that the Lord is good, if you've experienced his grace and mercy and forgiveness and the joy and the peace that only he can give, what are you doing going back to what's bad? So he's asking essentially if you've really considered the implications of the cross, if you truly believe that Jesus died for your sin and that the only life that's worth living is found in living for him, why would you ever go back to your old life? And so this morning, we know that's ignorant, don't we? Like, why would we go back? That's silly. But is it not so easy to do, church? It's so easy to fall back in these old ways of living, to go back to these sinful habits. Particularly when life is hard, we go back, don't we? Particularly when life is not going according to plan. Well, I'm just going to go back to what I was doing before. And even though doing that, living like that didn't work the first time or the second time or the 78th time, we're thinking maybe this will be the time that does. This will be the time that it'll last. Maybe this will be the fix. And Peter lovingly, delicately is saying to those people who think that way, morons. Like how ignorant could you be if you're going back to doing what you did before you came to know Christ? If you've seen time and time again, it doesn't work. Look, church. It's foolish to go back to anything in our life that hasn't fulfilled us before. Thinking somehow it will magically fulfill us now. And so I'll just ask you for a moment to think about this. What is it for you personally that you keep going back to? So maybe for you it is another accomplishment. Like I'm going to go back here and hope this actually makes me feel good this time. Maybe it's another degree, another promotion, another lot. Maybe for you, it's something else. Maybe it's another sexual encounter, another sexual experience. Maybe it is actually for you just another purchase, like maybe this will do the trick. Maybe it's another relationship. Maybe for you, it is actually another drink, another pill. Maybe it's another click, another show, another job, another hobby, another app. And we wrongly think this will be the time it fixes me, right? This will be the one that makes me feel like something where there's not emptiness in my soul. It reminds me of what the prophet Jeremiah says. The people of Israel are living in rebellion against God and they're not seeking him out. For my people have committed a double evil. They've abandoned me, the fountain of living water. They've dug cisterns for themselves. Cracked cisterns that cannot hold water. You see, this is how we look different than the world. Because when the world is unsettled, when they are unhappy, these are the cisterns. These are the kind of holes they're digging, but they're holes that actually got a leak. But not us. Because we know these things can't ultimately fill us. So we don't run back to things that we've done in the past. No, we run to Christ. We cling to him. Because we know, we've experienced that He is what can fill our hearts. He is what can fix your brokenness. So this morning, if you're here and you're broken, don't go back. Run to Christ even today. But think differently, hope differently, approach your past differently. Fourthly, we're going to be seen as different. You must see your worth differently. Because the truth is, if you don't know your worth, here's what you're going to do. You're going to spend your entire life trying to prove what your worth is. You're going to try to prove to people, hey, I'm worth this much. Look, what if I told you, if you're here and a Christian, you have more worth than you can comprehend. And it's not because you're good. It's not because you're so amazing. No, it's because God is gracious. That's what we see in verse 18. It's because you were actually redeemed from your empty way of life. Not with perishable things like silver or gold. Like, that ain't even going to do it. You're worth so much more than that. But you redeem with the precious blood of Christ. And so, look, maybe you're here and, and you don't really know exactly what this means. Like, redeem with the blood of Christ. Like, well, what is that? Well, here's what Peter's saying. He's saying that every single person who's ever lived has gone against God. Amen? And this is what we call sin. And because of that, every single person, so every person here, all of us, we are guilty. 
and our guilt at one point had cut us off from the good and holy God. And again, we could never be good enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't give enough to get back to him. So what God did, he sent his son Jesus to come to earth to live the perfect life that none of us lived, to die the death that all of us deserve, so that he could purchase us, so that he could ransom any who would repent of their sin and live in light of the fact that Jesus really did die and he really did come back to life. And that is what we're seeing. That's what Peter's talking about. Again, that's what we witnessed today in baptism. And look, it's when you know that you are worth so much to God that he was willing to send his son to be brutally murdered for you, to have his blood spilt for you, you don't really care so much about what the world thinks about you. You don't have to prove your value through them. Again, we, we've said it before, but I think it's a good reminder that if God saw us as valuable, valuable enough to send Jesus to die for us, then why do we care so much about what the world thinks about us? Look, that's what Peter's getting at. Again, he, he's not telling us be different for the sake of being different. No, he's saying if you think differently than the world, if you hope different than the world, if you see your worth different, then the result will be, fifthly, lastly this morning, then you're going to act different. Then you're actually going to be weird. And look, this morning, I, th I think we're probably all weird in different ways, aren't we? So we all have our quirks. I actually texted my wife this weekend, and I just said, honey, hey, can you tell me just a couple things, a couple areas that I'm weird in? And like eight seconds later, it was like a list of 15 things. And I'm like, wait, do you sit and think about how weird I am all the time? Like, like what's going on here? But she said, you do this weird twitch thing. You don't like coffee. You don't smile. You're OCD. You don't wash your hands, <laughs> which all are true. Um, and, and I know some of you German phobes are thinking, like, what do you mean by don't wash your hands? You, you don't want to know what we mean by that. But look, I know I'm, I'm weird. So in a way, are we not all weird to some degree? But look, this is a call as Christians. Again, go back to verse 15. But as one who called you as holy, you are also to be holy, not in just some of your conduct, church. Not just where it's convenient. But you are to be holy in all of your conduct. And look, the call to holiness isn't optional. The call to holiness is not just for a select few. Actually, what the Bible says in Hebrews 12, without holiness, hear me, no one will see the Lord. And we need to be prepared. Because what God calls holy, the world will call weird. Like as we wrap this up, do you know what the world will think is weird? They'll think it's weird that we don't spend our money like they do. They'll think it's strange that just because we can afford to buy something doesn't mean we'll buy it. The world will think it's weird that we won't talk about some of the things that they talk about. They're going to think it's weird that we won't watch or listen to some of the things they watch and listen to. They're going to think it's strange that we won't trash our bosses or our leaders like they do. That we won't interact on social media like they do. Look, you know what the world is going to think is really weird? That we won't live with someone or sleep with someone who is not our husband or wife. Like, I've got many strange responses. When someone asks me, Jesse, will you marry us? And one of my follow-up questions is, are you sleeping together? And if you are, will you stop? They think it's weird that that's important. But look, the world will think it's weird that we don't just give our kids phones to do whatever they want. They're going to think it's weird that we won't let the calendar dictate when we go to church. But we actually let the importance of the gathering dictate our calendars. They're going to think it's weird if you homeschool your kids. Like you should see some of the looks that you get when you're out. When somebody asks, hey, where would your kids go to school? And you say, oh, they're homeschooled. You can see the terror in their eyes. I, I know they, they want to ask the question, aren't you afraid? That'll make them weird. And I want them to ask because I want to tell them they're already weird. Like <laughs> they've already aced that test. The church, that's kind of the point. We don't want our kids to fit into the world system. We don't want them to be like little Kevin who just so badly wanted to be like. No, we want our children, we want ourselves to know it's okay to be different. 
Look, I will close with this. I know I keep saying that. But I heard this week about a kid, true story, who lived his entire young life working to be a football star. So he had the private coaches. He had the summer ball, the workouts, the trainers, practice all the time, all the stuff. But the problem was when he went to high school, the football team, they were not good guys. So the locker room discussion was always full of sexual conquest. And this young man, he, he was starting to become influenced by that. Again, true story. And so going into a season of something this young man had worked his whole life for, something that was so important to him, he went to his dad and said, Dad, I, I got to tell you something. I'm like, Dad, I don't think I should play. And here's what the dad said. The dad said, Son, I think you're right. Because being on that team is not going to make you more holy. So wait up, Jesse, are you telling me that my child's holiness is more important than them getting a scholarship? That their holiness is more important than them winning a championship than them or us winning at the game of life? Church, that's exactly what Peter is saying. He's saying if God has made you holy, we have got to stop trying to be worldly. He's saying be a weird parent, church. Be a weird student, young people. He's saying, just be a weird person. For even our Savior was thought of as weird in the world's eyes. I mean, what kind of Savior, what kind of King comes to die for his people? What kind of God would take on flesh and buy us back from hell with his own blood? Friends, this is what he's done. And that's why our faith and hope are in God. And so as the band comes up, I just want to ask you a question. Where are you not being weird? Where is it for you personally? Because we all got stuff that you know that you should be different, that God has called you, but you're not being different. And I would just ask you, would you repent of that and be weird? Would you not run back to things of your past that are empty? But would you turn and cling to Christ? If you're here this morning, you're not a believer. I would just say to you, God wants to make you positionally holy. He wants to set you apart from your path headed of eternal destruction. Would you repent and believe in Christ even today? Again, for the believers, will we examine our hearts? Where am I trying to be conformed to the world and not transformed by how I think and how I live and what Christ has done for me? Let's stand.